Welcome to the Sacred Rebels podcast. This is your host, Tay. And co-host, Amy. We're the podcast that fearlessly dives into the depths of holistic healing. Join us as we empower you to embrace your divine journey, confront sexual trauma, conquer addictions, and rise with confidence with life after trauma. It's time to unlock the sacred rebel within and enter a transformative path to self-discovery and healing. We are here to trigger you. By shattering stigmas and questioning societal norms, join us as we explore diverse stories of men and women showcasing that there's not one way to heal and the importance of community. Together, we will navigate the evolving human experience, embracing paths to growth and understanding. Let's Let's heal, heal, baby. baby. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to another episode of Sacred Rebels. We're so excited to finally be back after a couple week hiatus. Life happens. Life was lifing, but we're so excited to have Busy Gold here tonight. And after we do our big, deep breath, Amy is going to introduce her. So place one hand on our heart, one hand on our belly. We're going to expel all the energy out. And then a big, deep inhale in through the nose. Lift up, fill up, open the heart, open the mind, and then exhale, let it go. I am so excited and so honored to have Busy on tonight. Busy is the founder of Booty. She is the creator of Break Method. She's an author. She's a podcast. She's a mom. She is just a female entrepreneur boss. And I'm just, I've, she's been a huge role model in my journey. And I'm just so excited for her to share all of the magic that she is doing. Yes. And um, so, yeah. Let's go. There's so much to talk about. Right? I know. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm ready. I feel like we got, we tried to do this for the last three, four weeks. And I know. We well, all had some sort of revolving plague and yep. here we are. So yep. the That's timing right. is going to be divine no matter what. Exactly. It always is. So um, first, uh, or what do you think we should touch on first? What do you want to touch on first? There's a lot. Yeah, no. What feels we can we can go we can go you we can go wherever you want. I think maybe let's start with your background, your story, like a little bit of like how you got into break method or Mm -hmm. booty or created those first initial big, you know. That's how I know you is break method. Like that was like aim that was life changing when aim recommended that to me. So a little bit about that, how getting there. Yeah. So I started, well, I, it all started technically with booty, although the further I get into the journey, the further I of course realized that it actually all started when I was a little kid, which really, I think if we all go back to what we wanted to be when we grew up in some of the earliest stages, you can usually start to tap into the moment when your soul knew your purpose before the world started to cloud that vision. Mm. And it's something that I've been thinking about a lot because as a young child, spotting patterns in behavior was, was the thing that I was likely best at. And my dad would always look at me and almost like hit me and be like, how do you know that? How are you so perceptive at whatever insert the age? And he still does this to me today. I'll get random voice memos from my dad. That's like, just listen to your podcast. And like, where does this even come from? (laughs) How, like, how are you my daughter? Where is this coming from? Um, The wisdom, the knowledge. Right. And he'll talk to me and he'll listen to it. And he's like, I know it's your voice because I'm your dad, but it's hard to separate that as I'm listening to it. It's like, I can't actually imagine that. Yeah, I bet. I bet. And my sister right now is actually in break method too, after years of trying to get her to do it. And it's going great. And when I talked to her to check in, I was like, Hey, how's it going? She's like, honestly, the hardest thing for me is not that it's you on the videos. It's that our voices sound so much alike and I hate my voice. So I hate your voice. (laughs) Cool. Thank you. Love you too, Biatch. Um, You know what's funny about that is somebody told me that recently, Amna, actually one of our friends, she does um, Theta Healing, that our voice is our own medicine. Like our voice is created to be our own medicine and our own healer. So when you have that, because I always say that, I always like, I hate my voice. I hate hate the way I sound on a microphone. It's, It's very perceptive that she would say that. And 
usually you do hate the sound of your voice until you integrate with yourself and then it doesn't sound like you're hearing a stranger. I think what tends to happen when you first start to get yourself into a situation like, for example, podcasting, when you first start to listen to yourself back, there feels like a a disjointedness because you feel like you're listening to somebody that feels separated from you, which for what it's worth, I've spent the last 11 years of my life and really even before that being on camera and I had to get over that. A lot of people don't know this, but my strangest job that I had was when I was 23 and I was the host of a TV show on Fox Sports called Extreme Paintball Life Beyond the Paint. Really? Uh, yes. What a and little fun fact. A little fun fact. People I feel don't like know that's that, like a party I, I like singer a where of... everyone would be like, what? <laughs> I... <laughs> And I'm sure for the better part of like a year and a half, every weird paintball nerd in the world had a crush on me when I was 23. And it was just a super strange time in my life. But actually, it's it, it's an interesting story because that was the first time that I ever had to watch myself back on camera. Mm. Of course, you know, a lot of us are 80s, 90s kids. Surely we all had some moment of seeing ourselves on some sort of awkward family video. Yeah. I feel like that's not quite the same. This was like watching myself on camera, delivering talking points, whatnot. And I'm not going to lie. I watched it and I don't know what happened to me, but it somehow like fractured my psyche. And I went into this moment of thinking like, is that really what I sound like? Is that really what I look like? And then all of a sudden I started to become more aware of myself as I was speaking. And I couldn't go backward from that point. It was like, once I saw it, Mm. Uh, the separation started so all of a sudden I was observing myself at the same time that I was myself and interestingly enough I feel like some of the separation what was very uncomfortable for me it was actually some of the beginning stages of me breaking things apart to put them back together which ended up turning into break and I think a lot of what you were just talking about with that teacher that was talking about how your voice is medicine Mm. for you I can totally relate because as I would keep growing in my career and doing different things that were front facing on camera, even if it drove me to tears or I I was so upset the whole time where there was a part of me that wanted to critique what I was watching. I actually still to this day, I force myself to watch or listen to anything that I do because you learn from it. it is medicine. You notice, oh, there's a cadence in my speech if she says this. And I remember that moment that I got into my head. So it's like you're you're able to consume some aspect of yourself through observation and then integrate those pieces so I totally agree and I've personally learned so much about myself and my teaching abilities from going back and re-listening even though there are surely so many cringe moments that make me want to throw my computer (laughs) I mean same there's like which basically is like the first three years of booty they're all cringe for me where I go back and I'm like (laughs) really I had the balls to put that on the internet like well who who was monitoring <laughs> who me? Who let what me? Was good God, <laughs> who let me do this? We um, see that all the time, and we're like, like who, who let, let us? us? Who the fuck let us? Like, I don't or know who let who let me out of my cave. So, and at a certain point, probably like, and obviously, I'm skipping all around here, like major ADD person. But in the early years of booty, I had my second child, so my son Zeb, who's now turning eleven. And I went right back to being on camera, like literally right after having him and there's straight up some booty workouts where my stomach skin is like dragging on the floor during burpees. And I just was like, whatever, guys, this is my postpartum body. Take it or leave it. That's so real and authentic, though. I love that. It worked. It just looking back on it. All I can think is, wow, like, were you really aware of what you're doing? Because it just it was so ballsy that. I must have just either been delusional because I don't think I really was in that. I'm just really claiming this part of my body. I think I just more was like, I got to do what I got to do. And I'm just not going to look at it. Yeah. And booty is like the best workout for postpartum and rebuilding your ab, like the muscles after having that separation from, you know, having a baby. Yeah, core. Too, like. True story. And I think that's what did work really well is that I did go back right away. And I think, and I even said this, I think on my Instagram back, back then was like, Hey, every celebrity trainer I've ever seen magically emerges from their cave looking perfect again. And I think that sounds like bullshit. So I'm just going to be real and document the whole process. And of course I did go back to having abs again. I don't know where they are these days, but back then (laughs) I did get them back and then they disappeared again after having two more babies late in life. But I think, 
in those early years with booty, I started booty in 2010 and it was right after I had my first child. My oldest is about to turn 14. So booty is about to turn 14, which is crazy. Wow. I know it's been incredible to watch that journey. Maybe you talk a little bit about that because it's so powerful and she's so incredible and all the extra work that I know that you're doing into healing her. And I know she's healing you and it's really been beautiful to watch also. Such a true story. She, so without Sarai, none of us would have booty because that experience with her is part of what prompted the birth of booty at all. Booty was the medicine that I needed at that time. And that's very much how my life has gone is whether you call it channeling or being a visionary or just trusting yourself to grab information from something that is not necessarily three-dimensional or tangible, whatever word you want to put on it. I've always had an ability to call that information in when I needed it to heal And then once I was able to integrate it and master it, then I was able to teach it to others. And that's essentially every business that I've ever built has essentially followed that sort of formula. I was in dire straits. I was in need. I get the medicine that I need, understand it in a multidimensional way so that I can then pass it on to others. Same. Um, Right? (laughs) And I mean, I think that's... Same. I don't know how you guys feel about this, but one of the things that I find myself most frustrated about in the world that we live in today is that people have lost the ability to wrap their heads around the fact that this actually is how knowledge and wisdom is supposed to be received and passed. And that historically, it's not just go to school, have somebody regurgitate information that was regurgitated by somebody else, by somebody else. Everyone's just like, well, do you have your stamp on that piece of paper that you took that test? That is, that's not wisdom. That's something else entirely. That's literally passing through rote memorization information that may or may not be corrupted. And in many cases, that information is corrupted. And the people that filtered that information were gatekeeping. It's it's like telephone too. You tell one person something and then 15 lines down, it's a completely different sentence word. You know, it's the same exact thing. I'm having like the biggest struggle right now with, with that. Like, do I homeschool? Do I not? Like just all of it. It's just crazy. It's a crazy world we live in right now. It really is. It is a crazy world we live in. And I think the more people can remember our natural organic process of being able to grab information from something that is more intangible or multidimensional and bring it through our bodies to understand it, filter it, and then not just be the receiver, but also then in turn be the transmitter for others. That's, I think, how we as a collective get ourselves out of this rut that we're in, because I do feel like we've been in a rut yep. for an exceptionally long time. Yep. And the system is weaponized against people like us, yep. right? As soon as you're bringing through something, it doesn't matter how effective it is. It doesn't matter how transformational it is. People are like, well, but do you have a credential for that? Where's your piece <laughs> of paper? Where's your stamp? And it's like, I don't I don't need it. If I'm doing yep. something that works and is effective, there's no stamp that anybody could give me. What am I going to go do? Yep. go to school to learn about how everything I'm being taught is wrong. Why would I pay money to do that? Yeah, absolutely. I agree hundred percent. So I yeah, think and it's, it's more of that thing. Like, Oh, you just need like a piece of paper with a stamp on it. Why I'm doing that right now. I'm doing a sound bath certification at the studio. And I, it's like an intuitive one. I'm teaching. Like if I was like, mm-hmm. if you're called to take this training, you are meant to be here because mm-hmm. you intuitively need to listen to that, to do that. And it's like, but is it yoga Alliance certified? And, and we are, you know, because we can, but it's like, mm-hmm. people just want that. And it's like, yeah, well, what does that do for you? <laughs> well, and I think people maybe don't necessarily understand the function of organizations like this. And this is not to specifically target yoga Alliance, but just these organizations in general, they are very much a money-making business. They are yeah. absolutely for profit. And as soon as a company like this decides to become an accreditation body, essentially it's relatively a pyramid scam because in the beginning, your accreditation means nothing and your accreditation only becomes something that means something the more people you get to buy into your scam until eventually everyone's parroting your whatever acronym. But ultimately they don't really mean anything at all. Yeah, nothing. It's just a bunch of random hoops that you need to jump through so that they can make money and put their acronym on you. So, and I think that's why for what it's worth over the last six, seven years, actually a lot of prominent yoga teachers have actually pulled out of organizations like Yoga Alliance yeah. because what, what does it even technically really mean? I mean, our, and ironically for how much flack I get personally, 
for being in the mental health space, but not actually being a PhD, we are actually an NASW accredited program. So we're accredited through the National Association of Social Workers as a CEU provider for therapists. So it's just ironic that we've gotten yeah. to this place where people are more concerned about random stamps of approval than they are about yeah, whether something actually works or not. So yeah. I, I personally care more about effectiveness. So Same. I'm, I'm going to go with that. Same. Always. <laughs> Always. And it's so funny too, like knowing what yoga lens is, we like send the credentials in like the plan and we just send it in. It's nothing. They don't, they're like, oh yeah, cool. Check. Yep. You sent your check. Okay. Here you go. It's accredited. <laughs> yeah. And they tell you how to write it out. So yeah. a lot of people write it out that way and then don't do it that, do it way, that way because, because why? And obviously, yeah. you know, Booty Booty has Yoga Alliance accredited programs for 200 and 300 and 500. It, but like, honestly, it is just looking at a checklist, making your checklist match their checklist, submitting your checklist and then paying your money. So yeah. there you go. Now you guys know what accreditation really means. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Fun facts, more fun facts. <laughs> more fun, more facts. fun facts. And, you know, that's not everyone you're, you know, I, I support whatever floats your boat but yeah of course I think to to wrap this all up with a bow there are absolutely ways to grab wisdom from the ethers and yeah. teach something that is far more profound than you could ever learn in a book and yeah. there's no reading of a book that could teach you how to do that that yeah. it, it's everything to do with emotional integration and learning how to trust yourself to be able to carry a message like that through and I think booty is like the gateway drug for that booty is such a profoundly healing practice of not just the physical body, but I think the emotional and energetic bodies as well. Cause it does bring about that total integration. Yeah. And at the time that I brought booty through, I was in dire straits, desperately needed it. Sarai had died during childbirth for 20 minutes, came back to life after being revived for 20 minutes when everyone was basically like, wow. Hey, she's gone. Let's focus on the wife. Cause I was about to go too. And my dog started barking out of nowhere. And wait, was this a home lit- birth? Yeah, it was a home birth. So I was on the I was on the floor of my living room. And as this happened, I could see like from the floor, I remember seeing down the hallway and I could see blood all the way down on the floor, oh all the way down gosh. the hallway. So I was like, wow, I must be bleeding a whole lot here for blood to already be all the way down the hallway. And they had put Sarai on my stomach and she was clearly blue and not breathing. And at first they just, the midwife just kept slapping her in the back. And to be honest, even in this moment, I have a vivid memory of this and maybe this is a trauma response and it most certainly is. But when things get really bad, instead of going into fear, I go into a comedy skit in my head. And I remember this moment of being like, well, shit. I really, this is the plot twist. I did not see myself going out like this. I re- like, this is wow. the end, I guess. And almost laughing about it in my head. Not that it was funny, but more like, wow, I read, didn't see this coming. Yeah. This is a total shocker. And was kind of just observing it. And I mean, obviously I was so tired and clearly in a state of physical trauma that I couldn't do anything about it, even if I wanted to. Yeah. But I remember just kind of like accepting it and observing it. And even as they were trying to revive her, I remember thinking, I was thinking rationally enough to be like, well, if they do revive her, she's probably going to have brain damage at this point. What would that even look like? And I'm like running through all these seemingly rational scenarios, even as it's happening. And then finally, after 20 minutes, her eyes open, she turns pink, she starts screaming. And I just remember the midwife being like, here's your baby. And I just remember being like, wait, what? (laughs) hold on. And then I was looking and instead of taking the baby, I remember observing her and immediately noticing that ha- she was having seizures. So I looked at the midwife. I was like, isn't that a seizure? She's like, no, that's a totally normal newborn movement. So I waited again and again, like that I can't turn off this like logical scientific part of my brain. So I'm like waiting to grab the baby, but I'm counting in my head and I'm like, okay. And then every time I get to 20, then like her face does this thing. And I was like, are you sure that's not a seizure? Because I'm counting in my head and it's happening every 20 seconds. She's like, no, totally normal. My God. So I, I take her and essentially it was like the ultimate 
medical gaslighting scenario where she tried to convince me that what I was seeing, I wasn't seeing, and it was totally normal. And she just kept being like, no, 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 you're so tired. And I was just like, I really think I need to go to the hospital. And she's like, no, don't go to the hospital. They'll take your like, baby. Who away. even just, says that though? If you're like, let's go to the fucking hospital. Who's like, no, don't go th this, this midwife. That's insane. Her, her name was April. She's yeah. It was a nightmare situation. So she tried to gaslight me into thinking everything was fine. And that it was just, I was overreacting because I was tired and I was like, I'm pretty sure a child being dead for 20 minutes and me taking this position is not me overreacting because I'm tired. I think I'm being pretty reasonable here. And then she wouldn't latch. So I, then I remember being like, well, if she's not latching, doesn't she need milk? And I remember this is my first time kids. I'm like sitting here trying to ask all the, the seemingly questions. rational questions. Yeah. And she's like, no, some babies take hours to nurse. And I'm like, all right. So I get through the first few hours and then obviously TMI for some people, but I, if anyone's, I, it was a situation, right? Like I, I tore, she ended up having to cut me at the last second. Um, which to be honest, I remember at that moment being like, if you were going to cut me and you had that move, why didn't you do that? Like yeah. 30 minutes ago, <laughs> Seriously. Um, cause if she had done that earlier, this wouldn't have happened. And it's like, it literally, the whole thing, it's like, if you go from beginning to end, it was a list of everything not to do as a midwife. So it was a hundred percent midwife error. So I didn't need to experience this at all. Um, so obviously that's something that I have to live with and Sarai has to live with, but nonetheless, it's the situation that we're in. So at this point, she's like, well, I have to stitch you. And I'm like, you're not touching me with a 10 foot pole. I don't trust you. You're not answering any of my questions. And I basically was just like holding my baby, like everybody get away from me. And I made it about a day and I kept calling her and being like, she's still not nursing. And I, in hindsight, I think at this point, I was too tired to think clearly. And, yeah. and, she had, and she had scared me into thinking that if I went to the hospital at this point, that they would take my baby away and call CPS. And I was just like, oh my God, what is up with the what? Like, how is this even happening to me? Um, so eventually it hits this point where Sarai is still not feeding. I'm trying to take like a little dropper and like drop milk into her. Cause I'm like, she's got to be hydrated at this point. Oh my and gosh. She's still having the seizure thing. And then all of a sudden she spikes a fever and she's screaming. And I will at this point, and the midwife had even weaponized Sarai's dad at this time and the family everyone was like no, no no don't take her to the hospital and then I also was told I wasn't allowed to walk be right because I, I wouldn't let her stitch me up so I it's it hits this point and I feel like this is really relevant to the story because I had to hit this threshold where I was just like f this I'm not listening to anybody else anybody. everyone's lost their damn minds I don't even know why I listened to you up to this point and I looked at everybody and was like, guys, I'm taking her to the hospital. And they're like, you can't walk. You're not like, and I lived up on the second floor. They're like, you can't walk. You could end up going into emergency surgery if you walk. And I was like, listen, I, you guys can physically fight me, but I'm going to the hospital. And I literally packed up my newborn baby in the car seat. And I walked down the stairs and I literally was, by the time I got to the hospital, I was covered in blood. So of course they were looking at me like, um, what? <laughs> What is happening here? Yeah, are you? And I just are, was are just you well? like, you need to check out my baby, and they were like, we need to check you out too. And I was like, let's just focus on my baby, not realizing like, hey, I'm covered in blood at the same time too. I was just at this point, I was so tired. I was like, you need to take a look at my baby. So I gave them a quick rundown, and this complete asshole of a doctor happened to be on shift, and she was like, well, you really shouldn't. You really made some poor decisions in the last few days. Bet you're gonna regret that, huh? And I, I wanted to just physically fight this person. And then she goes, so is your midwife going to help pay for your bills for your special needs baby? And I was like, you haven't even looked at her yet. How do you know she's going to be special needs? And this is how they were talking to me at the hospital. So at this point, I'm like bawling, crying. Yeah, I'm just there defeated. by myself. Yeah, defeated. And they look at her and then immediately I start seeing them talk to each other and immediately they end up packing her up in an incubator and they've medevaced her to a different island without me. And I was like, what? What?" And they were like, you can't go with her. You have to have emergency surgery. And I was like, I'm not having emergency surgery. Um, they were like, well, you don't have a choice. I was like, I will sign again that I'm going against the doctor's orders, oh, but I'm not um, going to be separated from my baby. Gee. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me go in the medevac transfer with her. So I had to actually sign away this paper. They literally took my baby away from me without talking to me. So then I had to go book a flight and you know how I'm not supposed to walk, right? Now I have to go book a flight, go to the hot, go fly to the other island to go to the hospital. So it ends up turning into this whole ordeal where for a month I 
had to stay focused on the vision that I was shown for her and not fall into the same trap of listening to doctors. So it just felt like this whole month was just a repeat over and over and over again of being told something. And at this point, instead of listening to what I was being told, I had to check in with myself and just reassert what I kept hearing and seeing. So it built me up, although surely it broke me down in the process as well. Because for a month, I just had doctor after doctor tell me all these horror stories of what Sarai's life was going to be like. Yeah. And I just knew that it wasn't the truth. Yeah. And what's really unfortunate is Sarai's biological dad bought into all these stories and I watched how it would affect him and I'd just be like hey don't don't buy into this story like look at our daughter's eyes she's all there she's not gonna have cognitive yeah. delays like she's she's looking right at you she's you can tell that there's a spirit there and because they were trying to tell us that she was going to be on a feeding tube forever and that she you know would be completely cognitively delayed never walk never talk etc um And he just really bought into it. And I think he was already in a a pretty bad PTSD state because he's the one that tried to revive her because my midwife didn't do anything except try to slap her in the back and then just started screaming to herself, fuck, this baby's going to die. And I was like, okay, this is pretty sure this is not how home births are supposed to go. Oh my God, this is, this literally sounds like a horror movie. It was, I'm pretty, it's got to be one of the worst births situations that you can have. I mean, other than obviously everybody actually dying, but like from- from beginning to end, it was just like every era that you could think of back to back to back. Um, so I have to like kind of fight for this vision that I'm seeing for Sarai. And, you know, I'll jump forward in the story a little bit. Her dad bought into this so much and was like bought into this kind of medical delusion that he ended up committing suicide when she was two. <gasps> and it was a really just like the roughest year and a half ever where even though I'm watching Sarai make progress, I'm like looking for all these alternative treatments and like getting her stem cells. And I'm like celebrating every little bit of progress that we're making. It got to the point where he was just in such a dark place that I'll never forget. There was one day we were sitting on the beach in Malibu and it like, my life has always been a lot of high contrast. So imagine at this time, booty's taking off. I'm training Julia Roberts full time. I'm making more money than I could have dreamed of because we had been on food stamps at the point where I'm telling the story when we're back in Hawaii. So at this point, I'm like making a ton of money, training Julia Roberts. Things are starting to go so good. So I'm making progress. And then on the that, that same day, we're sitting on the beach and I just see him looking out into the water and he's like, three bullets, that's all it would take. And I'm like, what do you mean? three yeah. bullets like you might have a death wish but I don't and Sarai doesn't neither one of us are having the experience that you're having this is not a shared experience we don't want to die um and he just continued to live in this delusion like even though what we we were seeing as progress with her was very obvious it was like he almost was led to believe that it could turn at any time which doesn't actually make any sense so that whole year was so much growth and progress with booty while also taking care of a special needs child and then taking care of an adult who was at that point mentally not able to care for himself and eventually his mom invited him back home and had sent me a letter and basically said hey this is too much you're like trying to support your whole family you're trying to help Sarai it shouldn't be your responsibility to take care of an adult on top of this so just send him home let me take care of him And he only made it probably four, three and a half, four months before he killed himself. And he did it the day that we were supposed to go see him at the airport. So that was, I know Sarai was old enough to have some pretty vivid memories of all of that. And Sarai's always been, ironically, cognitively way ahead of her years. She's so brilliant. And even, and that's why I knew like back at that baby age, and obviously now I have four babies, I've never, at in four babies, I've never had a baby that was more advanced cognitively than Sarai. At six months old, she was already sitting and I had to prop her up with sandbags because she physically couldn't sit, but she would actually focus on doing a watercolor painting for an hour straight. Like six month olds can't do that. She was like cognitively prodigy wow. at those early ages. And she was just so perceptive. And I mean, now still, now she's turning 14 and she's just She's so brilliant. She's so funny. And, you know, to skip to the end of the story, Sarai, she walks, she's 
mostly nonverbal, but she can talk with her phone app and she's hilarious and she doesn't miss a beat. And she can say certain words, but obviously she can talk with her phone faster, but she's a brilliant writer. She's cognitively on point. She's a straight A student. She's always been in mainstream school. She's never once been in special ed. And my favorite thing, and I'll send you girls this video and you're more than welcome to post it because it's just the best thing ever. She switched to public school this year, which at first I was thinking, and I feel like this ties perfectly to what you were thinking about. Um, She's been homeschooled. She's been to private school. And at a certain point, she just kind of came to me and was like, mom, I just, I need to be around more kids. I need like a bigger, I need a bigger sea of fish. I'm sick of being at a private school. I'm like, I'm, I just want to see the, like what real life is going to be like. So she switched halfway through the year and I had a lot of reservations about it because it's a, it's a really big middle school. And within a few days, she already had a bunch of friends. And this is the part that I'll send you a video. They had their first school dance, right? So this is like middle school, first dance, Valentine's Day. And I happened to be out of town. So one of my employees ended up getting her ready and taking her. But I'm all nervous. And I get this video. And obviously, she looks smoking hot, like wearing this super like because she's just she's got like a bod on her for sure. And it's just this gorgeous dress. She looks so cute. And it's a video of literally her in the center with the whole school around her. And she had picked the song Poison by Belle Biv DeVoe. And (laughs) Poison is blasting and all of the kids are around her dancing. And she's like dancing in the middle. Everyone's like, yes, all right. She's like the queen of the school. So it just goes to show she's so great. And it just goes to show that if if I had bought into that lie, I would have potentially fed that lie and I would have changed the course of Sarai's life. Yeah. So I think that's just a good moment of reflection. Sometimes if we believe something to be true, we start to yeah. behave with fix whatever on, that yeah, thing is. On it. Exactly. In that way. And if I believe that maybe I wouldn't have spent all the money that I've spent on therapy or stem cells or what have you. And thank God I didn't because she's going to have an absolutely spectacular life. No doubt she will get married. She will have kids. Yeah. Um, and being technically special needs and having cerebral palsy, it doesn't make her skip a beat. She loves her life. She's so happy. And she does booty with me. Every time I teach, she does every class that I teach. And she's That's so, so good. awesome. She just has a little chair next to her. So if anyone's subscribed to booty TV and you've watched my recent workout, she's always, uh, you can see her in the back. She does every single thing and she's just, so she's cute. such a boss. Yeah. I think that's so important because I think that's what's happening a lot. We're, our, we're being so disempowered from our own intuition yep. by, you know, you go to a doctor and they're like, you have depression, you have anxiety. From day and one. People mm-hmm. are just, they're like, yep, you're telling me this. So I'm going to assign myself to it. And then I create this new reality out of this new. Yep idea that was imposed on me that probably isn't even truth I had somebody on my podcast probably a year ago and we were talking about just the origins and roots of the western medical system and more specifically the origins of women's obstetrics and gynecology in the United States and one of the things that was brought up that I found so interesting is that with the onset of more preventative care, right? So people going for like annual checkups and like looking for things, you would think, oh, well, if I look for things, I'll increase somebody's lifespan. But the opposite is actually true. The more you go looking for things, the more Western medicine intervenes and actually your lifespan goes down. Because as soon as you start to intervene, then there's a cascading effect. Oh, well, now you have this symptom. So you got to take this medication, but now this medication is causing this symptom. Now you have to have surgery. And it's like, if you had just not intervened so quickly, we might I have not like be a, in this situation. I literally have like a whole, it's the holi- the holistic healing web. And like you read mm-hmm. the symptom and it tells it, there's like the Eastern side and the Western side. And it tells you which medicine is for like from big pharma and then which like herbs or like, you know, supplements, anything different, like nature. Can I see, do you have that with you? Because yeah. I feel like my friend Dylan created that, but I just want to see if it's the one I'm thinking of. Let me get my headphone back in. Oh yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah, my friend Dylan created that. I bought it off um that's off awesome. this website, I forget. I think so it's yeah, Dylan, yeah, Deep State this... Mapping Project. 
was yeah, like that's the- Dylan. Dylan's amazing. I had him come speak at one of my events. He's but like, awesome. it's so true. Mm-hmm. Like for one of them, like I suffered with anxiety so bad. And it says like relaxation, sleep, ionic foot bath, breath work, kava kava, okay. like, you know, all these different things, a, a better diet. And then on the other side, it says benzos <laughs> or LSD. <laughs> mm-hmm. oh benzos or acid. <laughs> Just give me both. I'll call it a day. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but no, seriously, it's like so true. I feel like they, it's like, this whole entire what what this world has become is like just one big fucking sickness like they just want us so sick mentally Mm -hmm. physically spiritually so that they can continue to profit off of us yep that's how the world works right now period no matter who you fucking are left or right what you believe in spiritual not spiritual religious not really religious it's like we're just a fucking dollar sign to them a walking disease waiting to happen and a dollar sign if you don't take care of yourself. Amen. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. It's it's fucking crazy. I'm like, and most of the ways that you in? should be taking care of yourself are demonized in the mainstream yes, media. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Or not even talked about or taught in public schools or to our children or all of it. It's like, nope, you go to fucking school Monday through Friday, you know, morning to night same with workers you graduate you get a college degree you're fucking in debt from day one of your adult life it's like then you're you know you're chronically depressed and stressed out because you have these student loans that you can't even afford to pay for and we're living in an economy where people can't even afford groceries like the stress and the pressure of it all i can't even imagine like i can't even yeah, imagine it. That's why this next generation, I think, is so powerful and important. And I think a lot of people are waking up to what's going on and are changing and are willing to look in themselves and are willing to, like you said, not really worry about the credentials and actually figure out what actually works for them. Like, mm-hmm. oh, someone told me to try this thing and holy fuck, it actually works. Like, maybe I'll continue to do this. Breathwork, booty, like all of the things. I know, aim at the studio, like, Glow booty. Everyone fucking loves glow booty nights. Like it's still like such a big thing. Everyone's like, there's nothing like it. You shake it out and you scream and we all just have so much fun and the energy and the passion, like it does something to you. And so people keep showing up, obviously. It's it's incredible. Literally the practice is incredible. And it's, we'll talk a little bit about that, but I really also want to talk about the break method because actually, I I don't know if you saw it because I've sent you a few messages, but I actually didn't finish the break method because I stopped, but Mm -hmm. I want to just the booty. So we were talking about this before we went on live. So busy actually stepped down from booty, um, a few years ago and, I was teaching it at the old studio. And then when I moved to the new studio, I kind of phased it out. It wasn't, it didn't really align with me anymore. It wasn't feeling good. The The new ownership wasn't really feeling great. So I st- actually stopped teaching and I stopped practicing. And then I was doing the breath work and I was doing all in sound and things like that. And then randomly, um, Aspen and I, because Aspen did the booty training, also uh, my partner at the studio, And I was just like, you know what? Let's bring back booty glow. Like I need to move my body. Like I don't even care. I'm just going to do my own thing. Like I'm not even going to, I'm just going to like go back to the old school booty and I'm just going to teach it. And I I just need to bring it back. And we brought it back. And then two weeks later, Busy makes the announcement that she was back. And it was just like, it was so affirming. It was, it just like felt so divine. Love that. And yeah. And so let's, do you want to just touch a little bit about that? Yeah. So one of the, one of the things that I find the most interesting, and it's something that I've been saying and teaching since the beginning of booty, which is I've always seen myself as a caretaker of something that was already fully formed. So sometimes you go and you build something and it's like you build step by step by step. I really felt like when booty was given to me, it was given to me as a fully formed organism. Like it had its a mind of its own. It had a destiny. There was nothing that I could do to change that destiny. It just was already written and I just had to caretake it. So by the time we get to, you know, where we're at in the story now, like kind of February, 2024, I had sold the business in 2019. So I had been really disconnected from it from roughly 2019 and 2024. And I get the business back. And right when I make the announcement, 
I get a host of DMs that are like, this is so crazy, completely out of the blue. I went back to teaching booty a week ago or completely out of the blue. I just felt a call to come back two weeks ago. And the coolest thing to me is that booty over the years, I've done so much traveling to different studios and seen different people teach booty. I know that booty is an actual organism or channel or whatever you want to call it because no matter where you go, even if we're not together, somehow the practice is evolving in our bodies similarly. So like I could go to your studio and you'll start doing something. I'm like, oh my God, I started doing that last week. And you're like, oh my God, me too. Because somehow we're all connected spiritually from doing this practice. So Coral I'm not said surprised. that same thing. That's Love so this. funny because Coral came to my studio to do a yeah. class and she was like, Amy, she's like, you did moves that I haven't done in years, but I just taught them in my last class. It was just like, and she said that like same exact thing. Coral came. That's how it goes. Right I feel like she- that. And I think that's great. That's a great reminder that we're all tapped in correctly because you can, you know, just like you said, like there was a time that you're in it and then you were like, nope, this feels out of alignment. And if you're trying to force something, it's not going to come through your body in a way yep. that feels good or is coming through naturally. So this is, I think, a great sign that we're all tapped in for the right reasons at the right time and that everything's aligned. And it literally was like hundreds of people saying, I've not thought about it for two years and it just, boom, came back. And there were so many people that came back to teaching when I announced that I had jumped back in. And for what it's worth, I never wanted to be disconnected from it. I did want to sell it at the time because I wanted to be able to focus on break method. I wanted to be able to focus on spending more time as a mom. I had two babies during yeah. that time. So I, I, I had every intention of wanting to sell it for the right reasons. And when I did that, I, my, my intention was to sell it to people that I believed were very much aligned with what we wanted for the practice. And there's no way to know that with 100% certainty. I did everything yeah, I could to course. try to make it that way. Even turning down an offer for twice as much money to a larger corporation because I didn't want Booty to become corporate. And, you know, everyone goes in with good intentions and that doesn't always necessarily work out. And I think for better, or for worse, Booty went through the phases that it had to go through. And now we're all, we're back in it. I feel like Booty has so much potential and I feel like in so many ways it's better than ever and it's the people that are back involved we just had master trainer retreat just feel like everyone that was meant to be a part of it is now here and we're all much more mature and everyone I think is just ready to take it to the next level and back in 2011 I had uh, one of my clients got me this session with this really famous Vedic astrologer who has since passed but his name was Chakrapani Lal and He was doing my whole chart and everything. And he actually predicted that um, Sarai's dad was going to kill himself. And I was like, what? (laughs) So, and this was probably a year before it happened. He died in 20. What do you even do with information like that? Did you like obsess about it for a year? I had two people actually predict it. And so one was Chakrapani and G died at the end of January, I believe 2013. Um, and I, this other psychic that at the time, and I love him too. Um, I think his name's Eddie Connor. He was like a dear friend of mine back then. Um, he predicted it too. And when Eddie predicted it, it was like, obviously not just like, Hey, your chart says this. He basically was like, spirits telling me that I can tell you this and you can handle it. So I'm going to tell you. And I was like, okay, what? And he basically just said, you know, G's in the darkest place I've ever seen. His spirit really wants to go and you should let him go. And I was like, well, what what does that mean? He's like, well, I I think he's made the decision to take his life, which was not surprising to me because he had had a history prior to me even coming into his life of having suicidal ideation. Um, But he basically was like, I've never in my whole career seen somebody's soul want this badly to be done. Oh my heart. And he was like, obviously, you know, I'm not telling you what to think or how to approach this, but he was like, from my perspective, like he wants this so badly that who are we to try to prevent this? And obviously I did everything I could to prevent it without like physically restraining him and tried to talk sense in him, tried to get him to start eating healthy, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I think at that point, the way he described it, it was so clear that 
he was in that dark place because I could see it and I could kind of get there and make that assumption. But to have somebody more from the spirit realm side get in somebody's head and just be like, no, this is wow. this is about as bad as it gets, which made sense because, you know, how it would have to be really bad to finally be making like 50 grand a month when you were poor as hell living on yeah, food stamps and, and you're like sitting quits. on the beach in Malibu you've just been moved into a new house and then you're like three bullets and I'm like, what we just made it what's wrong with you I feel like that just goes to show too though that like that that shit doesn't matter at all when you're it's, in that headspace it's, it's here yeah 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 soul sickness is really hard and it takes a lot Insidious. of work to get out of that space and money is definitely not the answer that's gonna do it no there there was nothing physical that would have counteracted this and to be honest going through that whole experience for anyone that's ever experienced suicide especially when it's been after prolonged mental illness you kind of at least for me I couldn't help but feel some relief for him Mm. So, you know, there are, and I think people have a hard time talking about that or even admitting that people would look at me and they'd be like, why, why aren't you a mess? And to be honest in that very, like right when it happened, I told myself, I'm going to give myself five days to move through whatever emotions I have and just let myself be messy and whatever comes out, comes out. But after that five days, I have to focus on I have to be my a daughter. Mom. Yeah. I have to be a mom. I can't, I've been trying to piece this whole thing together and hold like 10 balls in the air for the last three years. I can't do that anymore. Like I will go through the emotions and I'll let that out. And then after that, I'm closing this chapter and I'm focusing on making Sarai's life fucking brilliant. Um, And a lot of people didn't understand that. A lot of people judged it. Even my mom. Dude, everyone grieves different. Like that's such bullshit. And my mom's a super nostalgic person that just loves crying and loves emotion and I've just never been that way so she just called me and she'd be like are you a sociopath why are you not crying and I was just like (laughs) he made this choice I you know I've got I if you love the person and you respect the person and it's not like this is a young kid he was 43 I think at least when he did it he had lived a lot of life that was a choice that he made and yeah if you love the person to some extent whether you like it or not, you have to respect them enough to respect their decision. And I, whether it made sense or not, I felt so much relief for him because I think he felt relief and our lives only got better from that point because we weren't constantly every day in a struggle and chaos, right? Like everyone, I was able to heal, heal more rapidly. I was able to actually heal more rapidly. Um, and because of that, all these other things started to heal. Falling right? into place, can't... yeah. Yeah, because everything's interconnected. And if you've got sickness in one area, it's only a matter of time until that's going to start to seep into other areas of your life. So going back through that situation, and it's something that I've tried over at least the last few months since I've gotten beauty back to just be a little bit more front facing with what was going on behind the scenes during all the years of creation of booty. Because I think sometimes people, they don't necessarily have perspective if they've never built a business or they've never grown a business that's gotten as big as booty did. They don't necessarily know what goes into it. And I think sometimes people need to shift their perspective. You know, everyone, they can kind of make up in their head what they think it's like, but it'll never actually be like that. And the truth is, for every year that booty was growing exponentially, my life had to somehow like go into the dumpster to make booty thrive. And yeah. a lot of times growing a business is like that because there's, you only have so much to go around. And typically for me to give to booty where the way it needed to, I had to take from something in my own life. So that's eventually what made me need to sell it. Cause I was just like, I, I don't, without forever damaging my family and my relationships with my kids. I have nothing else left to give. I need to have somebody else do this because I was tapped out. And it's just, it's funny to go back through the years where when people see a business growing, they have this perception in their head where it's like, well, there, this is growing so fast and busy must have all this money. And it's like, I think people don't realize more money, more problems. And the bigger your business is, the bigger your expenses are. And there were literally 
there were periods where I was having to cut payroll checks of a quarter of a million dollars every two weeks. Do you know how stressful that was to owe that much every yeah. two weeks because you have that many employees? I, that was awful. You guys would never don't want that again. We got so big and that all felt like it was on my shoulders all the time. Nah. Mm -mm. <laughs> it's really hard to be a business it's owner hard. and people love to like do numbers and like count things and like see like, oh, you've got this many people or you're doing this many things and they, they just like, see the number, but don't actually think of the expenses and the time and the education and the hours that you're putting into yeah. it. Growing a business and being a business owner is really challenging. It's and so hard. And there's no real such thing as work-life balance because inevitably as an entrepreneur, if someone's going to have to put it on their plate, it's going to have to be you. So you might strive yeah. for it and maybe you stick the landing a couple of times, but that doesn't ever last for very long. And then inevitably when you grow, whether they want to do this or not, eventually employees get mad that you have what you have and then they want what you have or want mm -hmm. to try to dethrone you or be you or whatever. And obviously, as you guys know, that's a situation Agreed. that I found myself in. And I mean, talk about one of the worst things ever to go through ever. That was the worst. Like I've had some bad things happen in my life. That was the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And every single one of those people that participated in that basically tried to they all coordinated to try to take me down to destroy me to build themselves up. And, you know, we're years down the road. None of them made succeeded. it. Succeeded. So none of them succeeded. So, none of them. you know, it was so whether, awful whether you're saying you karma's a bitch or whatever, like the truth will prevail and people just don't get away with that. You can try and sure you ruined my life for a little while, but eventually people are going to see the truth. Karma and justice. For some people it took, a few weeks for some people it took six years for some people still years later I'm still this was like it's been almost five years and I'm still getting people apologizing or coming back and like is it okay if I come back to booty I'm so sorry for what I did do and I'm like sure whatever that yeah that was on you bridge, but that was so horrible <laughs> I remember there was so much slant just like putting you like through the ringer and I'm like, I didn't know about any of this makes sense oh my god yeah you would have had insane. to be in like the private groups and the things and just yeah. like, no all they, it, it was like it, it was blasted it was it was blasted and looking back it. on it why I didn't it took me a while to even get my lawyers involved and I don't know in hindsight I don't know why I didn't just do that sooner because as soon as my lawyer was like oh you just have to post this then anything they do after that you actually can take them to court for so I was like oh it's that simple I just let this happen to myself for like oh, god months. there were people you guys setting up fake accounts to dm my boyfriend who's now my husband all day to tell him to break up with me there were people that were trying to um have cps called to take away my kids you guys it was it was literal insanity. I've Sounds never like seen Amy's more fucking like life right now. I, I, busy. I have the same Honestly. thing. I just, my boyfriend got a text message on Monday. It was the eclipse day saying that I've cheated on every person that I've been with. And that like, there's People this whole thing saying that they're the friend he never knew he needed. And like all oh this crazy God. stuff. And I'm just like, you're so, people are so weird. Like yeah. you're so it's, strange. So <laughs> Depending on what sort of what way you're looking at it, I think from kind of more of like a spiritual side, it would be like a dark mother attack. So it's like the wounded feminine wanting to take out someone who's actually powerfully standing in their feminine. And yep. in, in general, and this is something that I'm actually going to be talking about on my podcast in two weeks. In general, a lot of these people are covert narcissists. So they want to say that you're the narcissist and that they're victimized by you when the reality is that they actually are the narcissist and everything that they're doing and saying is complete and utter projection onto you. And what's ironic when I went through it, a lot of the stuff these people would be saying, I so badly I want to get on camera and be like, listen, bitches, all of this is recorded. <laughs> like you guys would go down so hard in court because everything they're saying, I'm like, I literally everything in break is recorded on video. You guys are absolute idiots. Yeah. So it just, it's all covert narcissism where their brain, and you know, maybe they don't realize they're doing it. And for a lot of covert narcissists, they don't realize that that is the mechanism that's at play. But in general, any powerful female entrepreneur, any powerful woman in general, you will end up with a trail of yeah. these women and eventually they want what's yours and they will single white female you and want to destroy back. you to build themselves up 
and yeah. it won't have to be based in any truth whatsoever yeah <laughs> it's, really it's is. wild which it's is why I feel like we're out here trying so hard to like build women up and we created this women's circle to like heal these mother and sister wounds that we've all had for so long because girls are fucking mean I was mean so and mean. people were mean yeah. and like it's like no that has to like end like we are stronger together and I think the more people that realize that the more we work together the more epic shit is gonna happen instead of That's just absolutely true tearing and each other down is, that is like booty and even though there's men that are in booty and that like that, that's you know there's a far and few between but there yeah. is but i think it's, booty, yeah, it's the definitely connection, female oriented yeah the connection of the classes and the movement and the yelling and the all of it it's, such it's so a, intimate yeah it's like a good it's like a good icebreaker too, especially like if you're uncomfortable to do those type of things at first, right? So like it's an icebreaker to then connect with these women. So then afterwards you're feeling more intimate with them because you just did like epic, you know, weird, cool shit together. And you're like, oh yeah. yes, this was dope. Like, you know. It really is, it is true vulnerability and intimacy, not this performative vulnerability that I think happens in a lot of circles where you're just sharing your traumas yeah. for the sake of sharing your traumas and putting something out there, which ultimately just segues into trauma bonding. This is like actually burying yourself in front of other people and pushing yeah. yourself past your perceived boundaries and sweating together and the oxytocin release. And then at the end, it's like, we're all, we're all made of the same stuff. And everything else is like personality and coping mechanism and all of that can just drop to the wayside and we can actually be really connected to each other. To me, there's <sighs> nothing better than the right after booty class. It's probably one of my favorite feelings in the world. Sweaty and I don't and know like that anything could euphoric. take up that same space. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah, the three pounds to the ground, it's just like that like <laughs> energy shift, that ground down, that connection, like there's... Yeah, it's we so should fun. end the podcast episode that way. And yeah. we, end, we, we opened with a breath. Let's like close with yeah. three pounds bang, to, bang, the, bang. to the desk. Bang, bang, bang. <laughs> I'm down for that. All right. So last thing, and, and there's just so many epic, amazing oh, things. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited up. to, I'm so excited. To oh, I think if you do. access, if you do this, it'll like, it'll just automatically put it up. If it looks like you're giving a thumbs up, it'll just float a thumbs up in the screen. <laughs> I'm, I'm so excited to connect with you at Sammy's studio in a few, in a few weeks. I'm, too. So I'm going to be up there. Like I'm so excited. Um, But the break method, which is incredible. And the level of healing that comes through that and just the the work, the, and I didn't even get all the way through it. And I, I shared this and it's, in the and message. And it's changed so much since you took it too. So I would I, love for you to jump back in whenever you're ready. It's so different now in a, in a great way, all like just very refined and upgraded. I'm so love ready. That. So I was... God, it was, what year was it that I was doing? It was that 2019. I think it was right I think 2019. Before, it was like right before all this stuff went down. Maybe even was, 2018. It was right around there, but it was right before my it wedding. It was right before we were, Kanan was born. Yes, right I remember before your you, wedding. Yeah, it you was were right before my wedding. Yes. Yeah, and I was doing this work and I knew that I wasn't supposed to marry Alex mm -hmm. and I figured it out yep. and I stopped doing the work because I was not ready to leave the lifestyle and I was not <laughs> ready to leave the money and I like dude had I'm dead this, I did like, not know that awaken yeah oh, I remember yeah. I remember you putting on the brakes and you're like I can't even talk about it right now and I was like okay cool well I'm here when you're ready <laughs> Aim. <laughs> you dead ass had a spiritual experience and was like this is not my man yep I knew and I also had the thing where there's this, I don't know if you, I mean, I'm sure you do, but there was a meditation that you had and you tell your brain that you're safe and it's for the healing. And it was like this whole deep meditation. And it was yeah. when I found out that my dad had left when I was nine months old and my mom was breastfeeding me and I figured out this whole like childhood. I was in my flow. Directed, directed meditation is so powerful it's like a, I swear it's like how I've done any of the things that I've done in my life I've created them all in direction meditation absolutely insane. so cool and I remember asking my mom being like what happened when I was like nine ten months old and my mom was like what do you mean and they had never told me and my dad my mom was breastfeeding me and my dad didn't want my mom to breastfeed me and my mom left and went to live in Connecticut with my and it was like my, oh my first like, experience of trauma my mom was like what the heck like how and I was like 
fucking break meth dude like the brain weird. remembers everything so when people are like i don't remember anything it's, it's never true it's literally never true we just have to find the right mechanism to extract the information but it's always there the work that this program that you have created is Wild. absolutely incredible and all of the stuff i mean you're just incredible you For really are worth, when i was getting married to Zev's dad so Zev was my second one um it was like after um Sarai's dad committed suicide I knew the same thing I hit the point where I was like I'm going through the motions because I'm pregnant but this is an absolute no like I know this is not the right thing to do but I remember also stubbornly being like and I'm gonna do it anyways and this is a true story which no one knows but my dad wasn't invited to my wedding he showed up uninvited to look at me and be like, get in the car, get in the, let's get run. In the car, get let's in run. the car right now. He was like, you did, you're not signing a prenup, get in the car. This person's just trying to take everything you built, like get in the car right now. And I remember looking at him being like, dad, for sure, we're going to get divorced. But right now, like, this is just this, what we're yeah, doing. This is happening. Deal with it. Well, um, it was hard because I had Xavier, you know, and like I was, you know, we already had a kid. We were together for five years. It was just like, OK, this is like the next thing. This yeah. is like and I, I just like went against everything that I knew, you know, and I thought I could just like stick it out and make it work. And well, lo and behold, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> divorced. And I've never been happier. <laughs> And money doesn't fucking mean shit. And I'm literally living in an apartment and I just had to give my car back and I'm broke and I'm building my business and I'm starting from the ground up and I walked away with nothing and I've literally never been happier in my life. So now yeah, being, being in integrity with yourself is priceless and there's no amount of money or material item that could make that feel good. It, it will never yep. feel good. That's the whole point. Cause your body your body does know when something's out of alignment and you can choose to ignore it and get really physically sick or you can listen and actually do something about it. And I got physically sick too. Yeah, you had to get yep. your gallbladder taken out. Yep. Well, that's some some rage right there. Yep. Oh, yeah. It's been a wild <laughs> few years for me, busy. <laughs> oh, my God. Insane. Yeah. So yeah, I actually maybe... found out I was pregnant with Zoe going in for gallbladder surgery and I had to have a sick gallbladder for 12 weeks. And then I had surgery when Zoe was 12, when I was 12 weeks pregnant, I had to have surgery and get my gallbladder oh, removed my out pregnant. That's crazy. Awful. Yeah. crazy, crazy. <laughs> yeah. So how many kids do you have now? Three. Three. And how old's the youngest? She'll She's be four be next four. week. four. Oh my She's going to be four. Yeah, what so 12, happening? seven, and four. All right. That's amazing. I'm so, I didn't even, I don't think I really picked up on the fact that you had another one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was in the time when like booty, it happened like when, you know, booty wasn't really a thing and, you know, it's kind of traumatic. There's a lot of stuff going on in all of our worlds, right? 2020, yes. I had her in 2020. She was a COVID baby. April of 2020, I had her two months after oh, COVID. Yeah. Yeah, I had Harley at the end of that year in December. So Harley is just a little bit younger than her. Yeah. That was a that was a wild year. I had Hayes at the beginning of 2021 and I had COVID. I got COVID when I was like 37 weeks pregnant with her. And I like thank God was like fine by the time she was born, like three days later. But I didn't even really get that sick. I had like a stuffy nose and a fever for like three days, and that was that was it. I mean, that's a whole, I don't know. I know. That's our, a whole other way. Let's not go there. there. Whatever, that's like that's a whole true. separate. Oh my like, yeah, we don't even do need like to go part there. Do like a part COVID test real? Let's just take a real pivot here. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about the break method because I really, I think more people need to know about it. It's, yep. you're also developing all these things about helping parents, parent, and reparent yourself. Like, yeah, all your reels lately. Incredible. Spot on. Thank you. Oh my God. I, I feel like social media is such a fight for me because I, but doing things that feel inauthentic makes me feel physically ill. And I know that there is a way to do things on social media that works. And then there's a way that doesn't work. And trying to find the balance between doing what works, but also not feeling like I need to fake it. Cause I hate, I hate faking anything. It's just really hard for me. I yeah. don't think I even do a very good job of it. Um, I was just teaching a three-day training for therapists and break method and my business partner was watching the training and the very first lecture, he was like, oh, you're pissed about something. 
can I can tell from here that you're you're like, you're hot you're heated. and then he was like the second lecture you were all good but like and I was like yes the first lecture I wanted to physically throw someone through a wall um, <laughs> so yes you're right I can't fake it at all so yeah, same. it's method. like my face doesn't lie right like it's like my energy oh, is really so hard but powerful. yeah your energy it doesn't I always you know my big joke and break is that your eyebrows are the last thing to catch up so you can really rewire yourself but at a certain point you have to be like just don't look listen to what I'm saying don't look at my eyebrows so I have a strong 11 right here because I'm always like this to my fucking husband like what right <laughs> well and I mean it just goes to show the way and this is just going more like into break relationship stuff for a moment, but your brain pattern is going to dictate the way you're perceiving reality. So your brain pattern actually informs the way I would label what happens when you squint with your eyebrows, right? So for me and my brain pattern, I wouldn't give a shit because I don't care what you think as much as I care what I think. Yeah. And then there are reverse brain pattern types that are obsessed with what you're thinking and feeling so much that they don't, they're not yep. aware of what they're thinking and feeling. Yeah. So ever that's that, by the way, plot twist, that's the covert narcissist sort of brain pattern type where you don't know what you're thinking and feeling because everything is observational from outside of yourself. So it's like you're almost you're not even present because you're more obsessed with what things look and feel like or what you think they look and feel like. Yeah. I'm more just like I just want to get across what I want to get across. And I'm not, I don't really find much value in trying to read into interpreting what you're thinking and feeling, but a lot of other people, they do that without thinking about it. They've decided how you feel about them. So they'll start to treat you as if their version of why your eyebrows were like, that is ultimately the truth. And then they'll respond to you and they'll be like, what? I was literally just focused. What are you talking about? Oh my God. That's literally always my say. I'm like, I'm just thinking like, I'm literally just in my head thinking when I'm cleaning or I'm doing like, I don't, I don't particularly love cleaning or organization. It's just oh, not my go-to thing. Like I'll do it. I'll do it. And I'll be good at it when I do it. Cause if I'm going to do something, I want to do it efficiently and get it over with. I don't want to drag it on, but I'm not somebody who's just little by little going to be cleaning and organizing. So if it's my time to clean the house, I'm going to be real tunnel vision focused on, it, and I'm going to do a badass job and I'm going to do it fast. And I'm going to do it well. And then I'm not going to think about it again. Cause I hate it. So I'll be cleaning. And my husband's like, is there something wrong? And I'm like, I've been cleaning this way for five <laughs> years. I'm not mad. I'm in tunnel vision. I'm really enjoying my mopping. Like, could you leave me alone? To mop <laughs> yeah. the floor? We're good. Nothing to worry about over here. <laughs> yeah. There's just my focus face. That's I look literally mad when me. I'm focused. So going back to kind of giving maybe like a two second overview of break method, <sighs> Break method is a data analytics approach to emotional rewiring. So break method actually maps the pattern of input output relationships from early childhood and predicts accurately with 98.3% accuracy, all of your patterns of behavior, your emotional addiction cycles, even how you perceive reality, even down to your deepest, darkest secrets and motivations that you would never tell somebody else. Wow, so cool. It can accurately predict all those in one session. So once we accurately predict all those things, we then go through a series of five different diagnostic appointments to see if your pattern holds up when it's pushed, poked, prodded. The, you know, the whole reason we call it breaking method is we actually try to break it to make sure it holds. If you think about a traditional talk therapy container, a lot of it's based on your narrative-based responses. How do you feel about that? When did it happen? You're not talking about data. You're talking about story. And then it's up to the therapist through their lens to try to interpret your story. Break method is built to prevent the therapist or whoever's leading the session from letting their own lens or experience of you influence the data. So they have yeah. to go with what the data says and therefore often the therapist doesn't change or shift the trajectory of the session because they're trying to then prove themselves right. We try to prove ourselves wrong. So by the time we're applying rewiring strategy, we're a hundred percent sure that what we're gonna give you is gonna work because we actually tried to prove ourselves wrong, not right. And I think oftentimes wow, in traditional so therapy, the therapist, once they think they see something, then they're just going to see more and more of it. It's like, if you think, oh, you know, I think I really want to get that new BMW. What are you going to see for the next week? Yeah. Everywhere you go, suddenly everyone has that BMW. Did everyone just start to have that BMW or did you just start to think about that BMW and now you're over identifying with it in your world? You're over identifying, which no human can get away from this unless you have a set structure that's data-driven to force you out of it, which is exactly what break method does. So the accuracy is there, the efficiency is there, and you know, tools like what you were describing, directed meditation, 
it helps bypass your brain's protective mechanisms like self-deception, which is when you're lying to yourself and you don't realize you're doing it, it it'll cause a blind spot. So an example would be, let's say you do your eyebrow thing. They start to get reactive and you're like, whoa, whoa, like, what do you, I'm just, I'm just trying to listen. I don't know what you're talking about in their mind. They now think that you're just trying to make up a story and that you really still are mad. I really, yeah. Right. Yep. Like, okay, cool story. I'm pretty sure you're still mad at me. So they're in self-deception because they're not willing to see that maybe they're wrong and that maybe they're reading into your behavior and that because you're so different from them, you could be seeing reality completely differently. So that's them being in self-deception. They've really decided, no, this is the truth. So I'm going to keep treating you as if this is the truth. Yeah. And obviously, I mean, that's what leads to a lot of relationship injustice is both people not seeing a situation the same way. And for what it's worth in relationships, most frequently you end up in a partnership where both people have a completely opposite brain pattern type. Some people are like opposites attract. This is more true than you could possibly know because to have relationship polarity, there essentially needs to be somebody that's more likely to be in their feminine and to be holding back or yielding. And then there's somebody else that needs be more dominant, more controlling. What do we think happens when two dominant controlling people get into a relationship? Toxicity. Yeah. <laughs> right? So it's going to get real toxic real quick. And then of course, when we get, when we break down the brain pattern type, so break method has found through going through thousands of client records that all of humanity can be distilled down to five brain pattern types. So essentially, no matter how different everybody looks, no matter how different our personalities are expressed, our communication styles, et cetera, there are only five start positions of a brain pattern type. And how your brain pattern type is configured is going to determine all of your future behavior, your choices, your relationship patterns, your communication style. So all of these things that we think are innately us are often coping mechanisms that are a byproduct of our brain pattern. And that really what we've found to be true is that instead of, you know, fix me, I'm a broken person and changing you, what we're really doing is we're restoring you back to the way that you actually came into the world before the world actually started wow. to impact you and pull and you away program from that. you. Exactly. So I think one of the things that people kind of misunderstand is that when people are like, break, change my life, I'm a totally different person now, right? Because that'll just come out of people's mouths. We're not changing who they fundamentally are. We're restoring them back to that, their ability to maintain their innocence, Mm. right? All of us through some form of childhood trauma, for the most part, we've lost our ability to be innocent. We've gotten shamed for being curious. And we don't feel safe seeking love for certain reasons. So one of the things that Break Method does is it helps reestablish your ability to feel and experience those things so that you can actually be yourself again and that your your personality will be able to have more dynamic range because a lot of us just think that we are who we are take it or leave it yeah but the reality is that a lot of us are capable of much more range than we currently yep. experience until we heal yeah it's like the little factory reset button on the back of a toy like <laughs> yes that- you're like mm, let's try this <laughs> again Yes, break it's method like is a, is a factory reset Spanish, that just takes a lot of you know, work. It's like with Buzz yeah. Lightyear goes to Spanish and then you have to like yeah. reset. <laughs> reset. Yes, 100%. So we get to go so, back and, to our factory setting. Yeah, so we we do. And I, I always say like we go back to our like God-infused spirit setting. Like that's who we actually were meant yes. to be before the world patterned us and pulled us away from that. And I think that is why for what it's worth and break method Oftentimes when you have this complete 180 in emotional healing, you do end up having the activation of spiritual gifts turn on right after that. And I've found that so many people that came into break atheists or having experienced religious trauma are just being like, you go on the ground, you die. That's it. I don't want to talk about anything else. Cool. Yeah. Once they go through break, eventually, whether they like it or not, break has some sneaky spirituality in it where you just, you that's wake up incredible. and you can't, you can't fight it. So at the end, you realize there is actually something else going on here. And now that I've moved through my trauma wounds, I can actually face it head on and want to explore it because I'm not operating in fear. 
Yeah, and you're it's really hard to explore spirituality when you're shut down in fear. It's borderline impossible. Yeah. And I tell everybody, I say it all the time because people are always like that. They're like, oh, like your gifts or this or that, or they see these people and they add, I'm like, you have it in you. Every single human being has the ability to have every single gift. It's like even talking to spirit because I do sound and sound breaks the veil with spirit. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to talk to spirit. Like it's a little scary, but I do see them. There is sometimes there's certain sessions and things that I do, but like I, you know, you can like shut it off also too, you know, like, Mm -hmm. but like every single human being has the ability to do. Yep to be so connected to that. I totally agree. And people just don't, they can't see it. They're like, not me, no way. I could never add that. So it it is this brain pattern and then subsequent trauma response that blocks that ability from coming through. So as soon as you heal that, those things, they just naturally turn on because I think that is naturally how we are supposed to be. Yeah. That's all, that's wisdom that, you know, no matter what ancient text you're looking at, we used to know how to do that stuff. And then I wanted, yeah, I we wanted stopped to ask, learning how to do that stuff. Yeah, I wanted to ask how Break Method came about. Like, what was the catalyst that drove that idea? So, crazy story. How how old is Break Method? Like, when was it? Like, it started when in 2014, so it's 10 years. Okay. 10 years, and there's been a lot of change that's happened rapidly in the last three years, especially. Um, but in 2014, I was in that marriage that my dad tried to rescue me from that. I knew I was getting myself (laughs) into trouble, but also was like, I'm pregnant. This is just what we're doing. This is happening. I'm just going to make it work. This is happening. I'm just going to accept my fate. Um, and things were really rough and I was struggling again. And I just remember at this point now, booty's taken off. I'm living still in Malibu. My son at this point was maybe like 10 months old or something like that. My son's up, who's about to be 11. And I was having all the these issues happen at home. And I just, that same sort of observer thing I was talking to you guys about when I first watched myself in the Fox mm-hmm. News show, all of a sudden that happened to me again, where all of a sudden, instead of living my life, I was observing myself live my life. And I just remember having to talk myself off the ledge, like, busy. I don't think you've lost your mind. So let's not go into full-blown panic attack here. This is weird. Like, this is a weird thing. Yep. It kind of feels like we're tripping, but we're just going to go with it. And I remember being in that state for like a week where I was not myself. I was slightly outside of myself and I was trying to tell myself to act normal, kind of like when you smoke too much weed and you're like, you Am think I it's like weird? a little disassociative almost like you're like, for sure. I was completely disassociated, but it was, I, now that I have a different perspective, I think I would, I was separating like the part of me that was a spirit I was actually separated from me, like physical and soul living my life so that I could observe myself so I could help myself. Yeah. So it was like that sort of dissociation, I think, rather than it being like a trauma dissociation, because I was very much there. I was probably more acutely aware than I usually am. Yeah. So it was almost like me thinking and then having another piece of me thinking and critiquing at the same time. I was like, this is crazy. Um. It's kind of like when you're on a Zoom and somebody shares their screen, it's like the infinity screen and you're like, oh no, <laughs> that was how it felt for me in my perception. And so I went through a week like that, just being like, holy shit, I hope this goes away soon. Like, I'm not going to freak out, but I kind of want to freak out. And then I go and I meet one of my friends at a coffee shop in Malibu and she had just come back from this women's sensuality retreat mm-hmm. and she was just spouting off some nonsense. And I just remember just for a week, I had already, I was already exhausted. And I was just like, whatever this mental state is that I'm in, I'm like, just, I try, I had to try so hard to keep it together and not freak out. Um, Cause it was like having a trip that lasted too long and you're like, okay, when's yeah. it going to end? When's it going to wear off? Like, yeah. I don't want to go back. Terrible. To again. <laughs> the worst so I was feeling. already on edge and I was just listening to her spout off this absolute nonsense that made no sense at all and she had just paid this coach so much money to just literally be lied to and I remember just sitting there and being like can I have a pen and I don't even know what came over me but I like grab this napkin and I grab a pen and what I said and what I wrote I've never said or wrote before now I realize that 
as I'm sitting there listening to it and critiquing it, it like at that point, it wasn't me busy doing it. It was like whatever this thing was, yeah, this it was like channel. me as a spirit <laughs> that was observing myself. It was like the spirit side of me was getting pissed. Like, no, this is a lie and like had to correct what was happening. So all of a sudden I start drawing these diagrams that I've never seen before at all. And I'm explaining a concept to her that I now know of in break is Eli. And it's become a fundamental part of what we do in break. But I like go on this whole dissertation and all of a sudden she's like, oh my God, like that's really profound. And I was like, it kind of is like, what even is this? I was like, where does this even come from? So then I went home and it was like, because I had done that, it was like, I opened it up just enough that all of a sudden I started literally hearing all this narration. And I was like, all right, maybe I've really lost my shit. Like maybe this is the end. And I went home and I went to Zem's dad and was like, hey, I'm either losing it or something brilliant's about to happen. Can you take care of Zev and Sarai because I don't know what's going to happen but I need to just like lock myself in my room for a few days and write and he was like sure I got you so I wrote about 83 I don't remember if it was 83 pages or 87 but it was like somewhere in that high number of just stream of consciousness notes diagrams making all these things and all of a sudden I just sat Incredible. there and so we're like taking this breath and being like what is this and at the time I was leading, you know, at the time Booty had what was becoming one of the larger yoga teacher training programs in the country. So I was traveling all over lecturing about energetic anatomy. And I was like, okay, this fits in with what I'm teaching. So I just added a lot of it into my next yoga teacher training. And at the end of it, I think I was at a training in Detroit. People were sending me texts and emails and they were like, I took, um, I took notes, like, here's your top 10 best quotes of the weekend. Like that was the most profound training, like whatever this is that you're on, like, this is what you should be doing. So I just started getting all this feedback. And then I realized every time I'm teaching, it's like, I'm completely out of body. Cause I'm not going there and deciding this is what I'm going to teach. So I'm literally leaving them. People are sending me all these things and I'm reading it back. Like, wow, that's pretty awesome. But I don't remember teaching that. So that carried on for maybe like another two years. And then I finally integrated all that information, but it was like two years of just being in the spirit and having all this stuff come through where I was almost observing it as it was happening and finding it equally as strange as it was exciting until it fully so integrated. Cool. And obviously people, people don't like that, you know, people that don't believe in that stuff don't like that. No, story. see, like I hear that and I'm like, that's a fucking gift. Like that was, was a gift. It was super intense. Anyone that, you know, anyone that's had information come through like this yes. before, it's, it's intense. You're, it takes a toll on your body and it builds up some emotional and spiritual resilience because it's like it, you have to literally straddle the line of two realities and try to keep your shit together while and try knowing, not to like, feel fucking crazy or like exactly. share what's coming through. You're like, wait, the, I don't know where this is coming from, but it's coming through, but I have to share it. But yeah. don't think I'm crazy because I just have to share this thing and it's weird and I don't know where it's coming from. I do this with Taylor yeah. all the time. I'm like, I don't know why I just know. Yeah. Or like there'll be a situation that'll be happening and I'll get this clear, direct message and I'm like, I have no idea where that came from, but I have to say it out loud. So I'm pretty sure this is probably the thing or probably what's going to be yep. next or what's ever yep. going to happen. And I'm like, I don't want to sound crazy, but you, you in today's society, like that's what it's looked upon. Like crazy. You're like, yeah. You're yeah, like, what it's do just you like, mean? I feel like we're all energetic channels. And like, if we allow ourselves to open to possibilities and ideas, I truly firmly believe that's just what happens. Spirit comes through. And you just have to not be afraid to look crazy. I'm fucking fine. Call me crazy. Who the fuck cares? I've been called crazy before. And (laughs) and I totally agree. And I think no matter what, when you're doing something that goes against the grain of what society tells you it should look like or should be, people are gonna think you're crazy and they won't understand it. But eventually if it works, it works. Literally wearing the shirt. Conspiracy. I know I noticed it partway through and I was like, I definitely need that shirt. Like I'm I'm so serious and I don't even care. It's like to the point where my husband's like, babe, can we just like not post on the stories today? Cause like I'm like, I don't give an a single fuck who sees my stories or what they have to fucking say about it. He's like, Well, I run a business, you know. I'm like, I don't give a shit people judge your business off my personal views that's on them babe like not on not on you or me not your people yeah yeah like I just don't give one single fuck and I I like when you said like when I'm not authentic like I feel physically ill same fucking thing like I can't not 
be myself or speak about things that I think are fucking important because I'm just not, I'm not willing to do that. Like I'm just not. And I don't care how many that sounds like awful. I can't do it either. And I'm glad you don't either. <laughs> I don't That's why fuck. we started this podcast. Sacred well, Rebels. Amy will be like, should I post this? And I'm like, yup. And then she'll text me back and be like, nope, I'm not posting it today. I'm like, good for you, bitch. Took the high road, but I would not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't post it. Not because of that. I post it because, you know, people like I to know. use it against me in court True. things that I'm going through right now. True. I mean, they did it yesterday when I was in the deposition, they pulled out some of my social media posts. They Insane. had them printed out and pulled them out in front of me. I was in a deposition. They held me for seven hours yesterday. Oh my people God. with the things that people can get away with because they have money is absolutely insane. And this is still part of your divorce? Um, Kyle or well, what? No, it's my, my oldest child's father. Mm-hmm. Um, through my divorce, my, my ex-husband was kind of like, you know, keeping him at bay a little bit because mm-hmm. he had the money and the other mm-hmm. one has the money. So they both have the money. They, they hated each other for the whole 10 years that we were together, but now they're besties working together. Oh, so no. Fun. Nightmare and they'll be situation. listening to this too. So hi guys. Hey, how's it going? Hey, we're out here. <laughs> I was once yeah, deposed. So- I was deposed for two days once straight all day long, two days for the same matter. And then my divorce trial took two full days. It was nuts. Oh, oh yeah. I God. have a seven hour trial schedule. They try to make it a three day one, but they, the, he moved it into complex court. Now, mind you, it's, it's a family matter, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Got it moved to complex court case. So we have a, on May 7th and it's so great because it's actually a new moon in Taurus on May 7th and I'm yeah, a Taurus. So I'm baby. like, baby. Okay, the universe, I see is on my side. But yeah, so I'm just, you know, doing it all with a smile on my face. Yeah, trudging away. I didn't away. see my son for a year. The only way to do it. You haven't seen him for a year? I didn't see him for a year. He's he's back here now. I just got him back a couple of weeks ago. But I have to do breathalyzers and drug tests because there's they think I'm a drug addict and an alcoholic. What? Yeah, oh, it's, it's, it's fucking insanity. Mm-hmm. It's oh it's God. a fucking wild goose chase is what it is. Like people it's just a witch can't hunt. stand to see her happy. And I think they just, she left a millionaire. Oh my God, she's on drugs. Like she left this high prestigious life. She's, she's definitely on drugs. Like she's fucking, Crazy. she's relapsed. She's mentally not there because how could she leave? I smoke crystal meth. I take crack. And even though I have hair follicle drug tests and fingernail drug tests that all say that it's negative, I'm just a big manipulating liar and I've got everybody fooled and everybody's drinking my Kool-Aid. I'm so sorry. That must feel really unjust, but I'm glad it doesn't seem like you give a fuck. It's been like infuriating just being a bystander and watch witnessing this happen, honestly, but justice will come, right? Like we talked about it. Karma, you said it took a few years for those people to catch up. Like it's been taking a little yeah. too fucking long, but it's coming. It, and, you know, years later, there's still, it'll still happen in random waves and you just have to keep doing you. And for what it's worth, if I look back at like my court to get divorced took me, well, it took me five years, but for three years, we actually were in like going through court proceedings. Insane. And our trial was scheduled for right when COVID started. So our trial after waiting all that time, it got canceled because of COVID. And then it just so <laughs> happened that when it finally came back again, the, cause judges will rotate and the judge that we did have was likely not going to be a good judge, but right when it came back again, it rotated onto this like very feminist judge and I was just like, oh, this is the best case scenario because she was just not going to buy any of his bullshit. And it was the trial was actually hilarious. And even though he was trying to take me for like five million dollars, he ended up having to pay me 50 grand, which like at the end of all of that, it's like Dad. you drove me through court for three months so that you would owe me money. Congratulations. How yeah, ridiculous. It's- it's crazy. And the only one that's suffering is the children. But luckily my divorce oh, yeah. with Alex, I had a prenup and it was like in done out. We like, it was like two months and it was just like, I, I literally walked away with nothing. I took my business and I was like, I don't want anything I like. And just was just like, bye, you know? Yeah. So that was easy. So that, thank God. I thank God for all of that, you know, and me and him are mm-hmm. co-parenting well. And I mean, as well as we can, I, whatever, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, my 12 year old that's suffered this past year through it all. And, um, 
you know, one day he's going to be old enough to realize what happened. And, yeah. you know, that'll be everybody else's karma because I know who I am and I know what I've done and I know what I've fought for. And that's, that's it. And I'm not, that's not going to change. I feel like that's a yeah. common theme. This, this, this interview is integrity. Just And really that's all like a big long game of chicken. So as long as you know, you're in the right, you just don't flinch. And I don't know if you guys have seen crazy rich Asians, but bok bok bitch, you just, you just don't move. <laughs> bok bok bitch. <laughs> bok bok bitch. You just stay focused. Don't you dare flinch. Yes. I'm focused <laughs> and I am not flinching. That's yeah, the you're thing. Gonna, you're going to make it as long as you don't flinch because it's, it's just a game. I was so sassy yesterday in the deposition. Like, I was super sassy. Yeah, about fucking time. But that's why I don't post things. Back to that. So there's some things that I want to be, like, out there about. But I'm like, it's it's not even worth it. I don't even want them to know that they even get to me sometimes. It's just like. Yeah. Bok, bok. That's what I'm going to start saying. Bok, bok. Bok, bok, bitch. (laughs) Bok, bok, you little chicken. Okay. As much as I would love to sit here all night with you two. Busy, what is one thing that you want our listeners to take away from this or like some magical life advice you could give or some golden little nugget? What is like one important thing you want to end this off with? I think no matter where you're at in your life, understanding your brain pattern and how that predisposes you to keep repeating patterns in your life. Cycles chaos, drama, relationship conflict, there is nothing more important that you should do with your time than figure out what that is so that you can heal it. Because when you heal it, every other part of your life gets better. Your spiritual life, your relationship life, your parenting life. So I just, I don't think, there's no way for me to emphasize that enough. Your brain pattern tells the story of where you've been and it also tells the story of where you were going. So if you want to change where you're going, You've got to figure out what that brain pattern type is and actually rewire it. Our tagline at Break Method is direct your destiny. I do believe that each one of us has a destiny that is a fixed point and and we are heading there no matter how many times we derail ourselves or delay ourselves, but you can certainly direct it and you can speed it up and you can stop cycling through drama and chaos that's unnecessary. So I think that's the most important thing to me. And I've seen so many people who from being in dire straits, suicidal ideation to nearing divorce, all the way to the other side of the spectrum where I've had people come to me and they're like, my life is perfect, but I want to, you know, hack my productivity or like, I want to get this raise at my job, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't matter what you, what, where you feel like you are in life, having this brain pattern type mapped, it's like the key to the universe. It's like the ultimate life cheat code. And we do actually have a version of this that is launching that can all be done on the computer. So we're going to be launching that in about a week and a half. And we've actually been for the last year developing a whole a whole app interface so for Break cool. that actually includes being able to track your biomagnetic field to actually see what emotional state you're in. So that's going to be oh launching soon. Oh my God, how cool. That I think I was talking to somebody about it this morning on a press interview and I think it's the future of biohacking, which is going to be emotional hacking because you can only take so many cold plunges and it's still not going to make you stop being a dick. You actually have to learn (laughs) how to stop being a dick. (laughs) Amen to that. It'll it'll work for like, you know, a couple hours, maybe. (laughs) That's it. Maybe. Or in general, a lot of the clients I've seen that get really into that, it kind of just fits into their pattern. And then the people whose pattern is not aligned with that don't get into cold plunging. So, which is me. No matter right. how hard I fucking try, I cannot like cold plunging. I try to turn my shower cold. I can't fucking do it. It's like, but you know how you said when I was talking about not liking cleaning an organization, are you and I are probably very similar and our brain and brain pattern types don't like the cold plunge because what's like, no, I don't like there. We're just not necessarily structure oriented. And we're <laughs> also not, there's a part of your brain that is very activated in some people and not activated in others called your reward circuit. And you likely just, you enjoy the process more than you enjoy the reward on the other side. And the cold plunge people, they're pleasure seeking, reward seeking, and they're looking for the dopamine hit. And you're like, no, I'm good. Put me in the sauna. I want a hot tub. Yeah. Well, I am definitely all about the hot tub. 
all about the hot tub and sauna. Me Heat too. therapy, like, I'll sit in the sauna and I'll sweat and I'll till, to the point where, like, I'll pass the fuck out. <laughs> Same. I just like to jump in the ocean when it's cold. There's something oh, about yeah, the I ocean. Do. That Rather, feels I, different. Yeah, I don't, I'm not, like, I'll take cold showers because it, like, wakes me up and I get a million things to do and, like, I have a cold plunge, but I more like the cold plunge in the ocean. There's something really powerful about yeah doing the breath work and going through into the ocean rather than just a tub Absolutely. of fucking ice water. <laughs> well, yeah. and I mean, everyone's motivation for doing it is going to be slightly different, but I think in general, I've worked with so many male clients who get really bought into biohacking and it's like whatever Joe Rogan or Wim Hof says is what they do. And that's part of their morning routine and they don't break their morning routine. And I think a lot of those clients, when they go through break, they see that their brain pattern made them easily marketed to, and that those things don't actually help serve as pattern opposition that helps them heal. It just perpetuates their pattern. So that's why I think Very once you know what your brain pattern type is, it helps you understand why you're motivated to do what to you do, do those so that things. You can, yeah. Exactly. So that you can see, is doing this making my rut deeper or am I actually helping myself get out of it? Because every single one of us needs to learn how to do the things that we don't naturally want to do to heal. Yeah. If we just keep doing what we want to do, we'll just keep getting deeper and deeper into our own rut. Mm. True. I know you I had said something. I'm going to say this grow. one last thing because you had said something because obviously me and Taylor both teach breath work. And, um, you had said that, you know, when we do these things and you're constantly re -traum like living in that re-traumatized, bringing those things up, that what you need, that what we're not doing is implementing the new experience beyond it. Right. Mm. So when I'm teaching the breath work, I make sure that it's like kind of like a process of that. Like, okay, we're going to refill it. We have a safe place yeah. that we're going to refill it. And then we're going to replace it with a profound, beautiful experience where we're, you know, yeah living in both that not just mm -hmm. the screaming the trauma the moving Absolutely. it from your body right like you have to make sure that you're implementing a like you're entering a new program mm -hmm. recreating a new program right it's not just about live it refeeling the trauma right you have to do and both I think, I think you're probably are you talking about the the webinar that I did or the video that I did that was talking about it for the somatic movement practitioner training so I think my biggest issue, and this is obviously I'm going to talk about breath work globally, although everyone's, of course, is going to have some variants. I think the bigger issue is that when you open up a space like that, people are very susceptible and they're very open. And I've seen that clients will start to over identify with things that they feel, and then they will actually add that which they're over identifying potentially into their story if that's not necessarily true. So then I've seen people through things like that, for example, start to decide, well, I was sexually abused because it came up in a training. Even if if we test it a million other ways, that actually seems to be a memory that might have been falsely implanted or not naturally occurring. And now because that's come up and they're in that open space, they're integrating that data into their field. And now they're going to they're going to potentially fracture healing that could have occurred if they didn't do it that way. And they weren't tempted to over identify with whatever that new information was that came up. So I don't know if you remember this, but from the perspective of something like directed meditation that we do in break method, one of the things that I encourage clients to do is, I don't know if you remember this, but I tell you not to go write down everything that you experienced right away and that you have to actually let yourself just integrate for 30 minutes. And that after 30 minutes, if you want to take any notes on what stuck, then you can. I think that's one of the ways to be a fail safe where it's not like everything you're finding. Oh, I have to remember that. Oh, I have to remember that. Oh, I have to remember that where it's like, you're trying to take these pieces. We've got to trust that our body's innate wisdom will tell us what need, what after moving through everything and your, your brain is sifting through almost like you're panning for gold. I don't know if anyone's ever panned for gold or like, you know, yeah. when you're like, um, what do they call it? Like sluicing or whatever. Yeah. A lot of stuff can come up. And when you're in a shared field like that, sometimes you can, if you're sensitive, you could be experiencing a memory that somebody else is having next to you. And you're like, oh my God, I was sexually abused when it could have come from the person next to you. So I feel like you have to go through this, this process where you're like sluicing and let it come through and not be so quick to grab every single thing and put it in because you run the risk of putting in a puzzle piece that's not yours and then wondering forever more why something's not quite right. And I've seen the introduction of information like that 
really damage people's lives when we go down to it and we go through the whole process that information wasn't actually there it was put in by like a yoga teacher training or something like that because I think people are more sensitive than they realize and when you're in a shared space like that it can be easy for things to seep into you from someone else Mm. I love that yeah does it, so I, mean, I not feel that like that's kind of like in a like critical a, way. It's no, no. Just, and I my, think- my, um, my EMDR therapist would tell me sometimes, like, because I would be like, I don't even know how the fuck this is supposed to work because I couldn't remember certain details of certain things or if it even happened, if it was a fragment of my imagination, all the things, right? And she's like, it doesn't really matter about the memory. It matters about, like, the feeling in your body and what, what that does to your nervous system and what's going on when you're in certain situations, you don't necessarily have to remember the exact thing down mm-hmm. to the detail, but we have to like get rid of it or change your response rate. So you're not in a fucking state of panic. If like one thing triggers you. Or... So I feel like that's, so there's a great example. And I'm, I'm just sharing this because I've seen it happen with so many clients, especially who have dipped into like either breath work space or certain types of yoga teacher trainings let's say your body's naturally having a somatic response that shows that you're dysregulated and that you've experienced some sort of trauma. Let's say that that person they're working on it and then they go do a breathwork training and then they have one of those experiences where either it came from somebody else, or maybe they were primed to think that because they just saw a movie like a week ago or they read a book, right? Cause your brain is constantly yeah, moving working. data around. That's <laughs> not necessarily yours. Your brain's always playing around with things. And especially the more visual you are, the more likely that is to happen. So let's say a bunch of like characters or tokens got put into your mind from just the week of whatever you did prior. And then you already have this nervous system dysregulation you could, and I've seen it happen before, go into a space like that where all of a sudden your brain is going to weaponize these different things that you've seen without realizing it subconsciously. And it will potentially give you this output of like, oh, I was sexually abused or you have this memory. It pops up like a memory of something really bad happening. What you're sharing is that that information could then go back and inform why your body is dysregulated. And that piece will forever prevent you from fully healing because you put in a piece that's not really there. So every time you try to rewire, even through something like EMDR, you're always going to butt up against something because you've implanted something rather than trying to resolve something that's actually there. So I think that's kind of, and it's one of the things that I'm going to be teaching a lot in the somatic movement practitioner training through booty is how to prevent that and how, cause I still think the process has to happen, right? It's, it, it is important for people to tap into that. Yeah. Somatic experiencing is absolutely real, but I think that we need to, there's a different way to help clients sort through those things without being too quick to categorize them, label them and identify with them. Cause I think I've seen that client, I've seen that lead clients in a really negative trajectory where they then take a story that absolutely could have been fabricated for one of the reasons we just described. And then they start to live as if that's true. And then yep. the next thing you do, they're like, Oh, I'm a survivor of sexual abuse. And it's like, Whoa, you would not have said that for the last 42 years. And you went to one breathwork class and now you're a survivor of sexual abuse. Like, yeah. are we sure we want to double down that quickly? That's my concern. Yeah, I think, and that it's it's also people just get in that victim mentality. Like they want to have Bing, this bingo. like level you, of trauma. They want to like, something. yeah, right. It's weird, but yeah, who the fuck wants that? <laughs> I'm like everybody, I'm, everybody. Like, wants I'm living that. it. It's 2024. And pray to be normal. Like, yeah, just, same. It's God. like that was one of the main reasons why we both started this podcast because we were both abused sexually by you know people that we were supposed to that were supposed to love us and respect you know what I mean family members and things as a child so for years you know we've been really open about that in our podcast and and we've had so many people come forward so it's like I definitely wouldn't have chose that for myself so (laughs) and I'll tell you right now the likelihood that you don't you're let's say a 45 year old person 45 year old woman you've never thought anything until one random day at one random thing. I'm sorry, but no, that is not how it works. It's just not, that's not, that's an implanted false memory. And I've just seen it happen too many times. Yeah. You would, you would know. And maybe, and and I've worked with so many survivors of sexual abuse. 
of course, there can be areas where there's it's gray area and you don't if especially if the age was close, you know, is this like peer exploration rate? Of course, there can be gray area where you might not know how to define it. Yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, you fucking know. maybe you don't maybe you don't know how to properly categorize it or language it, but you know, you you're know. not gonna randomly one day when you're 43 be like, I had no idea until I did this profound hypnotherapy. I'm sorry, but that's not how that works. Yeah, no, I agree. That's wild. Yeah. You guys, it's all over the place. I can't tell you how often I hear this story. And I that's crazy. Um, I honestly didn't even think of that scenario or even have that idea until you just put that in my head. Like, I can't well, believe people do that. That's fucking crazy to me. Now from over-identification, you're going to hear it everywhere. So <laughs> yeah. Now it's going to be like, <laughs> I want to see yeah. it on my I'm going to see it on my feed tomorrow because my fucking phone's always listening to me. So yeah, if anyone wants to jump in on the somatic movement practitioner training, we start May 8th. All the first modules are all online and then you just have to pick a graduation site. Uh, there's a graduation site in Vermont. So I think that's probably the closest so to you guys. So cool. Yeah. Um, and that's, it's a four month training. That one's going to be amazing. I'm really excited about that. And that's so what is it online? And then you go to graduation in Vermont. Yep. So I think for okay, you guys, cool. I'm assuming that a lot of your audience is kind of more Northeast oriented. Yep. So that would be the closest graduation yep. site. If you wanted to get wild and meet me in Kona for graduation, you can always come to Hawaii too. Oh my God. Hawaii's I always been that. a bucket list trip. <laughs> Oh so man, I wanted to, to talk them. about happy juice too, but we're, we've just. Oh my been... God, happy juice. Let's just, we'll do another one. That's fine. Yeah. We're gonna have oh my God, part two. Part, two. part two. Part two. Let's part two. leave yeah. them on a cliffhanger. Are we going to end with yeah. three slaps? The happy juice. Yeah, we're going to end with three slaps. And if you want to check out Break Method, you can go to breakmethod.com. And we're gonna... I try to answer all my DMs too. So you guys are always welcome to reach out. Yeah. We're going to link everything. We're yeah. going to link don't all you guys things. worry just it'll tell all be us busy like we can link the... and i'll make you guys i'll make your audience give me a link bio. Codes for everything too yeah awesome. well, i'll give you all the discount codes so cool Yay. yeah just send me like a whole little link thing and i'll add it to our description i will absolutely yes. amazing uh, thank busy, you I'm so much so 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 grateful i just love you so much and you've been just such an amazing mentor to me through all these years and i'm just so it was such an honor i was like I'm just going to ask her. I'm just going to ask yeah. her. I think she's going to I remember do we it. talked I'm about it. Gonna... She was like, do you think I should ask Busy? And I'm like, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I was like, what do you fucking mean? I'll ask her. Like, yeah, we should ask her. And I felt so bad when I kept having to cancel. I was like, I swear I'm not this Honestly, picky, but literally, no. it was like the plague was just cycling my It was life meant for to three be. Weeks. No, like, I honestly, it was meant to be. Oh, I canceled right two weeks in a row, like, after you said you couldn't make it. Like, I was dying and, like, had the worst two weeks. And then, boom, like, yesterday, she was dying. So, it just I was like, it I'm happened doing it perfectly. anyway. Well, yeah. thanks for pushing through for the rest of us so that we <laughs> can actually get this done. <laughs> I'm yeah, all so my kids excited. were sick. I, like, put them all to bed by 8 o'clock. I was, like, rubbing them all. I'm like, you all have to go to bed. Yeah, like, go to bed. Go to sleep. I just go to sleep. All right, we're going to end. Three – Three pounds to the to our desk. I'm gonna pound my mic. Doing. I'm gonna pound my mic. I'm gonna pound my desk. Ready? One, okay. two, three. Two, three. Woo! Listen, for three girls that are supposed to have musicality, that was complete and utter bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even hear so any fine. pounding. No. So did we? Get we all did it at a completely different time. So it's fine. Yeah. We'll okay. just we, we'll have better luck next time. <laughs> round two. There will it'll definitely be, better, be a round we'll, two. We'll how about there. how about busy pounds three times for us right now? Ready? Okay, ready. Just busy. Go. There you go. Perfect. I don't know if we can hear that, but it was it was worth a shot. Thank you so much, girls. It was <laughs> so much fun you. to spend this time with you. And I'll send you all the links and the discount codes, and let's definitely do a part two. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. And I'll see you in a few weeks in Maine. Yep. Can't wait. Woo! I'm excited. Bye, Bye. Bye everybody. Bye. Yeah. Thanks so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to listen to what we have to say. It means the world. As always, we want to end this episode by reminding you that we are not medical professionals and we are not giving any type of medical advice. We are simply sharing our experience and solutions. We are here with the intentions of reminding you that you are never alone and that everyone's healing journey is unique to the individual. Make sure to follow us on all social media platforms to stay updated. Stay well, sacred rebels. See you next time.